so we continue studying statistical tests and uh, I have several stories to discuss today. And uh, I would like to begin with uh, uh, discussing alternatives. Uh, and uh, previously, uh, at least on lectures, uh, we usually discussed uh, a case of so-called one-sided alternative. It means that uh, we had uh, the statement of our problem uh, assumed that we are interested uh, in, uh, in the question that asks that if it is true that one quantity is larger than another quantity. Like, uh, is it true uh, that people in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, are taller uh, than in Moscow? And uh, so we uh, we discussed a uh, statement uh, formalization of this question in form of uh, hypothesis, and we have no hypothesis uh, that uh, some value nu is equal to some value nu naught. Uh, so this is uh, this is mean five. In St. Petersburg, and this is mean by Moscow. And uh, we had an alternative that uh, mu is, for example, larger than mu naught. And this alternative corresponds to this question. This is a kind of why or, or yes or no question. And uh, the answer yes means that we have this alternative. This uh, this thing takes place. Um, and so, uh, what if uh, we are interested not in this question when uh, we already assume that we are interested only in the case when people are taller in St. Petersburg, and we are not interested in the opposite case. But what happens if uh, we consider different questions? Um, first of all, let us uh, discuss uh, what happens with this uh, statistical hypothesis testing framework if we assume that uh, if we assume that uh, we have data that are not a, in a good agreement with this uh, alternative. Just a second, I want to make sure that everything is recorded properly. Okay. Uh, what happens if we have uh, the following picture? Assume that our uh, theoretical distribution of okay. Uh, uh, let us begin with uh, data, with example, uh, with the data. Um, assume we have the following data. Is 125, and of my sample is 150, 150, 
to that. Uh, would you reject null hypothesis given this data? And uh, given this null hypothesis and this alternative, would you reject it? Okay, let me put some more numbers. Just to, just to make it more convincing. So, what do you think about this data and uh, this hypothesis? We would not reject no hypothesis. No, would not reject uh, any other uh, any other ideas. Any anybody disagree? So uh, what we have? Uh, what uh, we have? Sorry, and uh, I just wonder. Um, I wanted to ask about um, Zoom uh, people. Uh, so how should we uh, um, participate? We uh, should better write in no, the chat. No, just, or... no, just just uh, you can just uh, say anything, and we will hear you hear in the class. I, uh, yes. So uh, firstly, I uh, would like to say that we can. Um, uh not very uh, properly see the right side of the class board uh, just yes uh just okay. here we uh now i can see 10 and uh, i um, didn't I, I uh, didn't uh, so uh, i didn't see ken uh, before and uh secondly i would uh, like to say that um this sample um provides um many uh, like extremely low uh, values, mm -hmm. so they uh, uh, like 50, 30, um, it is uh, like, uh, it looks like the, um, the average height uh, in the sample is um, uh, notably uh, uh, lower than uh, assuming uh, the uh, like um, uh, it's lower uh, than uh, 125. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, we can we can find uh, we can find the sample average here. Uh, so let me let me do it. And uh, the values are very like unnatural, so um, it isn't possible that people would uh, be 10 yes but probably uh probably probably this is not about since peterborough probably this is about sheer uh so probably uh, probably these numbers are correct but they are just not about since peterborough but about sure so these people are hobbits um uh, so uh, again, I ask you to forget everything that you know about people's uh, heights, and just assume that we are that uh, we discussing not the actual people but some magical creatures of different heights. Uh, so um, indeed, if I find sample mean of uh, of this sample. Uh, then uh, we see that uh, this sample mean is much lower than 122. Actually, only one number is larger than 100, uh, 125. Uh, and the rest of them are much, much less. And, okay, anybody can find mean of these numbers? Okay, I can, I can probably use some calculator here. Oh, it is 150, 170, 170 probably uh, is a gamble uh, plus 52, 77. 77, okay, thank you. Uh, so sample mean is 77. And uh, if I would draw a picture uh, like uh, the one that I 
uh, used uh, at the previous classes. Uh, then we have some, uh, we have sample averages. So we have a distribution of sample averages provided that new hypothesis holds. Uh, how does uh, it look like? Uh, again, I'm interested in the distribution of possible sample averages of sample of this size one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements. 66. 66. Okay. It's not very, not very important, but yes, thank you. I, and if I would draw a, a histogram of possible sample averages, sample means. Okay, let me use the same word. Uh, provided that new hypothesis holds, uh, where uh, will it uh, concentrate? Near which point? I like to draw something like this. And uh, what what is the number here? Anybody from Zoom can. Can answer me? I just want to make sure that everybody can see everything and follow everything. What do they write here? This is the distribution of averages of sample averages provided that new hypothesis holds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one answer in my direct messages, and it is correct. But anybody else? So under the new hypothesis, uh, we assume that people are in Saint Petersburg have the same height as people in Moscow, and we assume that uh, people in Moscow uh, have average height of one hundred. Uh, 25 and so uh, so possible sample averages are somewhere near this this number again uh, i say that i say this under condition that new hypothesis holds otherwise i cannot draw any pictures like this because i don't know uh, what is mu but if i believe in this new hypothesis then mu equals to the knowledge and everything is known so uh, I can put here 125. And uh, if I uh, if I put on this this picture, if I put this value, this is my observed sample mean. So this uh, this sample means are uh, uh, theoretical. This is theoretical curve. Uh, theoretical sample means. The distribution is drawn uh, provided the proof hypothesis holds. And if I put the actual observed uh, sample mean, then I have to put it somewhere here. Uh, this is my observed sample mean. Which is 66 in our case. So uh, I didn't uh, I didn't find uh, any exact numbers, but uh, let us discuss how to interpret this result. Uh, we see that probability to observe this value, provided that new hypothesis holds, is very small. Uh, does it allow us to reject new hypothesis in this in this setting? Uh, like uh, maybe we should uh, count uh, the uh, p value. Okay, to... how would you count the p value here for this point? So, 
the value is some probability and you can uh, you can find it uh, using this curve right so how would you find uh, how would you find p value for this point actually i don't know mm -hmm. nearly, nearly zero it's not zero, but zero. zero, but how uh, how did you get it? Uh, okay, integrate this this curve, but with by, by, by which by which uh, interval? Like on the left from this point. On the left from, from here and there, but why? Um, why you integrate from here and there? Okay. Okay, my point is the following. Let us uh, look again at uh, our hypothesis. Uh, we chose between these two options only. Uh, there is no option to say that mu is less than mu naught in this statement, in this problem statement. So, uh, if you are if you are choosing only between these two options, uh, this result is it a good uh, is it a good uh, argument in favor of this alternative? It is not. Uh, so even despite the fact that probability to get this kind of result is very small, it is not. Uh, it is not an argument in favor of this alternative. In some other settings, we can say that this is an argument against this null hypothesis, but not in this setting because in this setting we choose only between these two options. And to be count as an argument against null hypothesis, only those arguments that also are in favor of this alternative. So basically, it means that if you are asking, uh, if you are asking this question, you cannot use this data to give positive answer for this question. And every negative answer counts as not a general hypothesis in this setting. Uh, and basically, if you find p value according to this, according according to this uh, hypothesis, you have to find probability to get the data that we actually observe, and more favoring to alternative. Uh, which data are more favored to alternative uh, than this than sixty six? Where where the corresponding uh, where the corresponding means are located that are more in favor of this alternative, more support of this alternative. Everything on the right, yeah. And actually, if you find the corresponding p value in this setting, uh, then uh, you will get this error, which will be very close to one. And you will not reject all the causes, of course. Okay. Uh, it is possible that initially, uh, when we stated our hypothesis, we said that we are interested not in this question, but in the opposite question. Is it true that people in Moscow uh, are shorter than people in Moscow? Uh, is it true that people in St. Petersburg are shorter than people in Moscow? Uh, in this case, you have different alternatives here. And in this case, this data will be in favor of rejection of null hypothesis because they, uh, they will be in favor of, 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 of this alternative. But uh, what happens if we are not sure which question to ask, if we are interested in both possible, both possible alternatives? Then uh, we do it in a bit different way. 
let us let us uh, edit this picture a little bit. And uh, let us ask, is it true that people in St. Petersburg um, uh, have different mean, mean height? Uh, compared is so now uh, we have different question now we don't have this asymmetry in the question we don't say that we are interested only in one outcome we are interested now in both outcomes and we want to understand which one is true. And uh, in this case, uh, alternative is written uh, in this form. This is no, not equal to no, not. So both possibilities are interesting. No is larger than no, not, or no is smaller than no, not. And uh, again, I want to repeat at least partially uh, the procedure that we discussed uh, on the previous lesson. And first of all, uh, I would like to ask you uh, how uh, your decision rule will, uh, will look like. So again, we have, uh, again, we have some sample. And we have x bar and uh, we have x bar of zero actually of the sample mean. And now, uh, how do you think, uh, what is the decision rule? When you reject null hypothesis in this case, with this alternative, uh, just, uh, I want a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to think about it. And if you have answer, you can uh, write it to my direct messages, for example. So what is the decision rule in this case? Which values, which sample means um, will be a good arguments against null hypothesis in this case? At least, what kind of? I, I, I'm not asking about the the final decision rule, but at least uh, which values which values would suggest that no hypothesis is not true? For example, if I get value here, is it uh, a good argument against no hypothesis? Would we reject no hypothesis if if we have uh, observed sample uh, observed sample mean somewhere here? We probably will not because it is uh, quite possible to get uh, this value even if no hypothesis holds, even if people in Moscow are the same as people in St. Petersburg. So we have some we have some variation between between this sample means, and we understand that this this variation is just due to due to randomness in our data. Uh -huh. 
me yes. Uh -huh. So I have two answers from Masha and Dasha and anybody else? So previously we said that we, uh, we had uh, alternative that mu is larger than mu naught. And we said that if we have uh, observed observed uh, sample mean somewhere here, if, the, if it is very large, if it is much larger than uh, 125, then it is an argument against null hypothesis. But uh, what differs in, in this setting? We can say or yes. write? Well, anything. If you wish, you can say. If you wish, you can write. So I think that we should find two x criticals in mm -hmm. this case. Mm -hmm. One if mu is larger or if it is smaller. Yeah, yeah. Actually, in this case, uh, both values that lie here and values that lie here, they both are in favor of this alternative. Mm -hmm. Last year, like two uh, symmetrical x, x mm -hmm. Yes, in, in fact. In fact, due to symmetry of this distribution, it uh, makes sense to uh, create a symmetrical rejection region, Oops. symmetrical critical region. So uh, we put uh, we put some value here. We put some value here, and we put some value here. And we say that uh, we will reject new hypothesis if we are here or here. Right? Okay, uh, please don't. Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions if if you feel that uh, anything is not is not clear. Hmm? Um, previously, you said the significance value. Yes, yes. I will. I will do it at the next step. Yes, we will discuss how to plug the significance level into this picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, indeed, that, uh, that's a good question. Now, how to choose this 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 critical uh, this x critical? Uh, previously, we said that uh, we have to put it in this in the way that this area is our significance level. But what now? Let me recall that uh, our idea is. Uh, to control the probability of type one error. So to control the probability to falsely reject null hypothesis, provided that null hypothesis holds. And if null hypothesis holds, then this distribution holds. So we can use this picture to analyze the probability to reject null hypothesis, provided that null hypothesis so the probability to make type type one error, and we want, uh, for example, we want to make type one error uh, with probability less than or equal to five percent. So how to choose this, this threshold? Um, again, uh, let, us, uh, let us wait uh, half a minute. And I ask everybody who, who are not in class to write me in private messages your ideas on how to choose, how to choose this, these thresholds. 
Again, uh, you have to choose it using some area under this curve, because area under this curve uh, is probability for our sample mean to be in some region. And uh, we want to make sure that this probability is less than 5%. How to control this type one L? Mm -hmm. Just a second. Okay, so previously in uh, in uh, With uh, this alternative, we said uh, that we want this probability to be uh, five percent because uh, we said that if we if uh, we are here, we will reject no hypothesis. In, in this setting, in this uh, you know, with this alternative, so large values uh, suggest us to reject no hypothesis in favor of this alternative. And uh, we want that the probability to reject null hypothesis, provided that the actual distribution of sample means uh, satisfy this null hypothesis, that this probability is less than this 5%. How to adapt to this picture for this new setting? Mm -hmm. So again, I have two answers from Marsha and Dasha and anybody else. I just want uh, everybody to participate. Can I actually ask a question about yes. how, how should we type X bar? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean that uh, I know how to do it in Latyakh. Mm -hmm. like slash bar slash uh, space X. But I'm not sure about any other okay. formatting tools. So uh, I ask you to either answer this question or ask me uh, any question that uh, you believe uh, are um, that there are reason uh, why you can't answer this question. At least you can at least try. I have two pictures rather similar. And you have to adopt one picture to to another setting. Okay, then uh, I can probably ask somebody personally. Uh, Anya. What do you think? Mm. Dimitri?
Can you hear me? Okay, just put, put put plus in the chat if you can hear me. If you are if you are not uh, at the class. Okay. Um, yes, actually, I um, can hear you, but I don't have um, uh, um, any idea of how should we uh, um, count these uh, thresholds. I just uh, understand that they, they are like symmetrical. Yes. So maybe we uh, just could use the uh, mode of uh, like. Uh, no, uh, no. Well, let us let us think in terms of uh, of this curve, which is a distribution, and uh, we are interested in events like uh, that. We are okay. How? Uh, uh, why? Why we choose this uh, to be five percent? Because we understand that if no hypothesis falls, then uh, our x bar is uh, distributed according to this uh, according to this curve so and i'm interested in probability to reject new hypothesis when it is true if it is true then uh, according to this curve if i'm uh, so if i'm here in this region when when i reject new hypothesis then probability of this event to be here uh, equals to this area, this area that I selected. And I want this area, this probability, to be uh, less than uh, 5% or equal to 5%. And actually, I put this threshold exactly uh, at uh, the value where this area is 5%, because it is, it is the maximum possible, uh, the maximum possible uh, way how, how I can do it. But now I have a little bit different, a little bit different picture. I have two ways to reject new hypothesis. I can reject it by being here and I can reject it by being here. Uh, but again, my, my task is to make sure that probability to reject it, provided that new hypothesis holds, is less than 5% or equal to 5%. So some uh, some area should be equal to five percent. I'm just asking which area. Mm -hmm, I see you. Mm -hmm. Any ideas? Do you know the answer? Okay. So uh, we will reject uh, null hypothesis if we are here or here. And uh, we want the probability of this event to be equal to 5%. Uh, then uh, let us assume that our picture is symmetrical then uh, which area should be allowed here? So, So if I want that overall area to be less than 5%, or better to say equal to 5%, and everything is symmetric, then I have to put here which area? Hmm? Okay, I believe everybody in class know the answer, so uh, sorry. And uh, I, I, I want to make sure that everybody in Zoom follow me also. So my question is for those who are in Zoom, what, what number should I put here? 
Just say it. All right, mean direct messages. Okay. Five percent. Uh, there is a uh, there is uh, there is an option to put here five percent and here five percent. So to choose to choose these thresholds in such a way that here are five percent and here are five percent. Everybody agree? Okay, there is another option, 10%. <laughs> so, uh, what to choose? Maybe two and a half. Yeah, uh, the, the, the third option, uh, 2.5. 2.5. So, which one is correct? Uh, note that both both events here and here they both lead us to rejection of null hypothesis. So if, for example, if if I choose this uh, this variant five percent here and five percent here, then what is the probability to reject null hypothesis? Ten percent. It will be ten percent, but we want it to be equal to five percent. So, uh, what should we put here and here? Then two and a half. Yes, we are interested in in this level. Okay. Everybody agree with this with this threshold. Can I ask a question now? Huh? Does it mean that our alpha is two and a half? No. No. Alpha alpha is probability to reject null hypothesis. And the probability to reject null hypothesis in this case is five percent. Mm -hmm. Yes, but the last time when you draw this graph, you how to say it in English. So you the part and you called it alpha. Yes, it's alpha now. Yes. Yeah, but, yeah. Yes. Uh, this is correct. But it was drawn for this alternative. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we have only one way to reject all the bodies. Only this part will reject mm -hmm. all the bodies. So this is this is why I uh, asked for this only for this area to be equal to uh, alpha. But in this case, I have two ways to reject no hypothesis, this way and this way, the right way and the left way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to and I want to make sure that probability to reject it either way equals to 5%, not larger. And again, th this is the same 5% as previous, but due to the fact that I choose different hypotheses. And I have now I have different ways to reject a new hypothesis. And this is why I have to split my 5% in two parts and distribute it, uh, distribute these two parts between these two ways to reject new hypothesis. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Does it make sense for you? Yeah. But it means that I gave you the wrong answer. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I really want this to be clear because this is how this uh, hypothesis testing works. And um, uh, actually, this is important. This is important thing. Uh, and. Uh, let me uh, let me assume that my 
Let me assume that my observed value lies somewhere here. And uh, you know that this is uh, this is uh, this is your threshold for uh, for symmetrical geometry. And you have another threshold for asymmetric alternative, for alternative that was that that is like this one. And uh, assume that the threshold for alternative for this alternative is somewhere here. So this area is five percent. Now let us assume that our data is in between, in between of these two thresholds. What does it mean? It means that if you test, uh, if you test this alternative, then you reject null hypothesis. If you test this alternative, then you would not reject null hypothesis because these thresholds are different. So the outcome of your statistical testing depends not only on data, but also on your hypothesis, on what you are asking about. And you see that if you use this alternative like this one, you to reject null hypothesis, you have to to have larger difference between uh, this value and the value that you observe. You have to be here. And actually, this makes sense because in this case, you have more ways to be wrong. And so you have to be more, more cautious. You have to be more conservative to compensate for the fact that you have several ways uh, how you can make an error, a type on error. And uh, this can lead us to some incorrect application of statistical jokes. Uh, let us assume that uh, I think in the following way. Uh, I look at the data and I see that my point is here. And I say, okay, I see that in my sample, a uh, sample of people from St. Petersburg. Uh, has larger uh, larger height than people of Moscow. I'm here to the right of 125. Uh, okay, you say uh, that's good. That, now then uh, let us use this alternative. And you use this alternative and you say, okay, we reject no hypothesis, everything is fine. Uh, what's wrong with this reasoning? What's wrong if I choose alternative after I look at the data? What's wrong with, with this way to think? Like we answer the different question? Um, when we choose other alternative? What, what? Mm. Well, basically, you just adopt question to, to the data. If you see if you see that you are here, then if you are interested in difference, then this difference is just can be to to this way. So it looks it looks reasonable. So the problem is not that we are answering different question, but something else. What is what is the problem with this reasoning? What is the problem with this procedure? To look at the data and use uh, the alternative that more uh, that that corresponds to your data. Again, Actually, in this 
Mm -hmm. uh, what, will, what, what will be wrong? What, which condition will be violated? So the actually it says please take all the this must be true mm -hmm. things, but we check the data from the data, but it's not from our hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but but what is the clear violation of uh, of our requirements? Yes. So one Yeah, exactly. Uh, in fact, if we if we will use this procedure um, a lot of times, then basically it means uh, that if we will adjust our alternative just by looking at the data, it means that you will reject null hypothesis if you are here, and also you will reject null hypothesis uh, where. In the uh, yes, symmetrically, symmetrically to the left here. And you have here a probability to reject null hypothesis to be 5%. And here. And now you have probability to falsely reject null hypothesis 10%. And this is a violation of your requirements that you put uh, for, for your statistical test. Uh, this, is, uh, this is first, but not the last. Um, example of so-called p-hacking, when people look at the data and then they are trying to uh, adopt, uh, uh, they, 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 they are trying to adapt uh, their hypothesis in such a way that these hypotheses are in agreement with data. You, you can't do it, at least unless you do some proper, you know, some proper adjustment of your p-values for that. Uh, and basically, that means that you can't do it. Yes. So, but then when can we ever use this five percent threshold? I mean, if you are, if you are sure that you are interested only in only in this question, um, for example, so, uh, I can decide it before that. And yes, you can. I I want. Uh, You have to you have to decide you have to decide which alternative to use before you before you look at the data from some other theoretical consideration. For example, if you do drug testing and you have two groups, and one group is your uh, group the, who who received your, your experimental drug, and another group is is uh, uh, just placebo group who didn't receive the drug, and uh, then you're most probably you're interested in the case when drug works and if drug doesn't work or it makes situation even even worse that you, you don't want to disti distinguish between these two options so in, in this case you're interested in this alternative but if you're just a researcher who are interested in the question like which value is larger this value or this value then we are interested in uh, in this uh, alternative. You had a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, heuristics, I mean, on a scientific level, the really most, the, the highest level is that person who has like five percent. I think so. Because I've never seen something. Probably, I, uh, I don't know. In linguistic, people still use 5%. Yeah. Okay, so are there, are there, are there uh, any, any question about this story? About the story of alternatives? Yes? So the thing is, if I set it higher, is it going to be the 10%, for example? Is it determined by the results and the parameters? If you yeah. if you say if you use significant level of ten percent, yeah. 
Uh, well, then it just means that you may be wrong more often that it is allowed by by some by some field, and it allows you to. Uh, so, in this case, you need less data to make some claims, but at the same time, this is this is done uh, by the price of, of uh, by the price of increasing of this uh, probability of error. Okay. Actually, uh, I have I have a question about alternatives. Yes. Uh, so. Um, like, uh, could it be uh, that we need, like, uh, the um, alternative are, are asymmetrical? So uh, we basically in t in t test you have three uh, you have three options for alternative either either uh, mu greater than mu naught or mu less than mu naught or mu not equal to mu naught. Did you mean something else? Oh uh, no! I think yeah. I think I just um, maybe uh, misunderstood something. Mm -hmm. So like uh, we uh, use um, like uh, we use um, two and a half percent from each uh, from each part. And could it be like that uh, something is uh, more likely than? Um, some another way so like we ah, put ah, three exactly. and, and so, one and that uh, doesn't make sense to shift it somewhere uh, yes yes uh, yes the, uh, the, basically, uh, basically theoretically you can do it in this way if you if you uh, if you put it in advance so before looking at the data if you say my thresholds will be like uh, here one percent and here four percent Okay, fine, but I didn't ever met with uh, with this kind of test, but I cannot see any uh, objections for this kind of test if you if you need it. But uh, at the same time, I can't imagine uh, the case when you need it. Um, basically, you just if you if you don't know which uh, which alternative you want to check, uh, you just check the same alternative. Okay. Uh, so the last point about these alternatives, uh, this this is about p values. If you have this uh, symmetric alternative, how to find p value? For example, okay, let me redraw this picture once more. Uh, so. Um, so this is symmetric alternative, and let us assume that my uh, my x observed is somewhere here. Uh, how to find p value in this case? And again, by definition, p value. Uh, is probability uh, to get the data uh, we observed uh, or more in agreement with alternative. Uh, so, uh, previously, uh, when we discussed one sided alternative, when we discussed alternative greater, we said, okay, this value that we have and the values that are more in favor of alternative are all these values. So, the value is this thing. But uh, what can we say now for symmetric alternative? How to find the value?
which other values are in favor of alternative in the same way as, uh, as uh, the value that we actually observe, or more in favor of alternative, if alternative is symmetric. So not only these values, but also which? Uh, symmetric, yes. We have to put, uh, we have to put here uh, the same value, so this is equal to this. And all of these things are also are also counts as the data that are more in agreement with uh, an alternative. So in this case, a p value is not just probability of this table, but probability of both this tail and this tail. But due to symmetry, probability of uh, this and tail and this tail are equal to each other. So it means that probability here, uh, that p value here is just a twice as large as the corresponding p value for this alternative. So when you switch from this alternative to this alternative, it is equivalent as you just multiply p value by two. Okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, for example, it's fake, right? Uh, well, it depends. It, it depends on what you are doing. Uh, this is just this is just a mechanics. Mm -hmm. So I just say that if you have the same data, and if you have two possible alternatives, this alternative and this alternative, then p value here is twice as larger as p value here. Mm -hmm. You usually want smaller p values. So if you if you shift from here to here uh, without um, just just by looking at the data, then then yes, it is p hacking okay. because you just you just decrease your p value uh, without any uh, correct ways to do it. Uh, excuse me. Yes. But again, this uh, twice larger p value should be less than alpha, so less than 5%. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. In fact, if you look at this picture, you see that everything, everything uh, is correct. Because, for example, if you are just at this threshold, uh, then your p value is uh, 2.5 times 2. And this is indeed a threshold. So if you if, if your value is somewhere here, then you reject null hypothesis because your p value will be less than five percent. And if you are here, then you will not reject null hypothesis. Okay. Okay, so uh, I have 10 minutes more before the break. And actually, uh, I had one topic to discuss at the lecture, but I don't think that it is a good idea to start it right now. Probably, uh, let me show a couple of things with R. Okay, let us make a 10 minutes break, then I will show you something in R and then we, uh, uh, and then I will uh, tell you something more about it as. Can I ask one more question? Yes, please. So again, last time we discussed our decision rule. So X bar should be less than, so X bar should be bigger than X observed. So, so P value, oh no, so I understood. <laughs> okay, good. Other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Ну, правый использует Киев. Это хороший вопрос. А, значит, смотрите, тут история такая. Я сейчас все чудесно занимал под ковер. А, значит, история такая. Есть, собственно говоря, настоящий титест, который использует Т-распределение. Т-распределение у него достаточно тяжелее. И оно работает. Ну, как бы у него такое условие, что вот если вы считаете вашу статистику, а, как, а, как, а, на дисперсию, значит, если вы считаете это статистику, и если x исходная выборка была из нормального распределения, а, и номера гипотезы выполнялась, Тогда, значит, вот эта вот штука действительно распределена по Т-распределению. А дальше возникает следующий вопрос. Значит, дальше утверждение такое. Если n большое, а если n... то происходит две вещи. Во-первых, вот это Т-распределение начинает стремиться к обычному нормальному распределению. А во-вторых, ну, за счет чего это происходит? Это происходит просто за счет того, что у вас ну, вот единственная проблема с этим распределением, почему оно, не, почему оно не совсем работает, что у него вот это вот, а, значит, что оценка дисперсии может быть неправильной. Вот. И за счет этого у него как раз просто начинает потешать. Потому что если бы у нас данные были бы из нормального распределения, а вот эта вот штука была бы частной дисперсией, то тогда бы эта штука была бы идеально по нормальному распределению. Распределена просто потому, что это была средняя нормальная, сумма двух нормальных нормальная, и тут вообще никаких проблем не было. Но если она стремится к бесконечности, с одной стороны, вот эта штука, а, значит, вот эта вот штука, вот эта штука, начинает быть распределенной просто по нормальному закону, и вся вот эта вот штука начинает быть распределенной тоже примерно по нормальному закону. Поэтому, в общем, для больших n нам вот это вот требование нормальности а, нормальности самих данных, оно не требуется. Потому что данная предельная теорема для больших n будет гарантировать, что вот это, что просто нас по нормальному закону, это все, что нам нужно. Для маленьких n, теоретически, если мы откуда-то заранее знаем, что x взяты из нормального распределения, то тогда мы можем сказать, что в этом случае действительно важно, который из нормального, хоть там три элемента выборки, хоть два элемента. Но, кстати, с одним не получится, но два уже должно получаться. Мы знаем, что все корректно. Мы знаем, что тяжко распределена действительно по тому закону, который мы там человек подсказывает. И, в принципе, есть исследования, в которых такая реально сделана типа выбор из пяти элементов. Взяли пять человек, все вот. Но тогда дальше возникает вопрос, а почему вы верите в то, что ваши данные из нормального распределения? Вот. Я, честно говоря, ну, тут... На эту тему есть разные ритуалы, типа давайте, давайте применим эти критерии нормальности. Я очень небольшой сторонник этого дела, потому что, потому что если у вас данных мало, то у вас любой тест на нормальность скажет, что они нормальны. Просто потому что в тесте на нормальность нулевая гипотеза это наличие нормальности. А альтернатива это я вот. Поэтому, если данных мало, то нулевая гипотеза не будет отвергнута, и многие это интерпретируют как ну, вот, показали, что данные нормальные, что делайте эти тесты. Короче, мой подход здесь такой. Если у вас данные не сильно катастрофически странные, если у вас этих данных ну, хотя бы несколько сотен наблюдений, то Т-тест становится за тестом центральная предельная теорема вас спасает, и можно очень не париться. Если у вас данных супер мало, то, в общем, ну, хорошо, вы ничего не сделаете. Вот. Поэтому я вот к этой всей петрушке, связанной с проверкой нормальности, отношусь довольно скептически. Вот. В принципе, наверное, ну как бы, окей. Если вы из каких-то соображений знаете, вот, у вас было перед этим много исследований, которые показывают, что действительно вот такие вот данные действительно, действительно похожи на нормальность. Окей, вы можете для маленькой выборки применить Т-тест, частный Т-тест, который вот, чистое распределение, с правильным количеством степени свободы. Надеяться, что лицензент пропустит. Надеяться, что у вас надежность вашего теста будет нормальной. Ну, в смысле, правильно. Ну, как бы так. Спасибо.
Понадобится что-то не из базовых Не думаю, что есть.
Excuse me, I think you can go to the mic. Okay, uh, now can you hear Yes, me? now we can hear. Okay, that's great. Uh, I just wanted to show a very simple thing that, that, you, that you probably already discussed with Ivan, but uh, probably after today's lecture, it will be more clear uh, why we need this option. And uh, to, to do it, just let us uh, use some numbers. And uh, so this is exactly the, the test that we discussed in the lecture. Uh, I have a sample. And uh, I have some mu node. And uh, let us test is it true that uh, the corresponding population mean uh, is okay? Let us compare it with 125 in different ways. Um, okay, let us find the, the corresponding mean. Oops. Uh, so my sample mean is 96, and which I compare it 125. So let us apply the test function, and I have sample, and I have mu, which is actually my mu node. And then I have to use the option alternative. And uh, we have three alternatives here and they are encoded as uh, less, larger, and decided if, I, if I'm not mistaken, but I can check it in the... Hmm. Uh, so two sided less or uh, greater. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so let us start with an alternative greater. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what will be the re result? So now our alternative is mu larger than mu naught. Uh, this this means that alternative is greater. So this is basically the description of this sign. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what will be the result? What will be? A, uh, what can you say about p value in this case? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, let us find it. And uh, we have this result of t test. And you see that p value is O dot uh, O dot 98. Uh, so this is this is actually a case when your data contradicts an alternative. Right, because we have we have this alternative, but our sample mu uh, sample mean is less than mu naught, and in this case, p value is larger than one half, because if I would draw the picture, let me let me just plot it in some way.
So uh, this is the distribution uh, that I can draw here. Uh, not actually the distribution of means, but the distribution of the corresponding t statistics. And uh, if uh, if we if the difference between mu and mu naught is negative, then we are some somebody here. Uh, actually, we can find uh, the the t statistics here. It is less than minus three, so we are somewhere here. And uh, the corresponding area that corresponds to this alternative is uh, all this area. So it is very close to one. Uh, just as an exercise. Uh, now we can find uh, p value for alternative. And uh, we can do it uh, without f, without r. So if you know that p value for alternative greater is this one, what can you say about p value for alternative less? One minus this p value. No, uh, yes, because uh, if this p value for alternative greater is this area, um, then uh, p value for another alternative is this area. Okay, let me draw it like minus five to five. By the way, correct degrees of freedom is four in this case. I don't know why, but never mind. So uh, if we if we start here and we go here, this area and this area should sum up to one because it is a uh, probability. You with with probability one, you are either here or here, and uh, this is why uh, we have to. Uh, we have to obtain p value uh, so we have to get something like this uh, let us test that uh, it is indeed true Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. You see that? This value and this value coincide. And finally, let us consider uh, two sided alternative. Again, uh, the same question. Um, uh, find p value for alternative two sided. And again, uh, we can do it without r. If we know that one-sided alternative for this part is O dot O one seven six, what can you say about two-sided alternative? Alternative for for p value for alternative that mu is not equal to mu naught. Who can find it without without calculation uh, without without this function t test? Mm -hmm. You can. Anybody else? It is twice this value. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we will have this tail and this tail. Let us uh, let us check.
in red. This is just as twice as the previous one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you see that? This is science. It works. Okay, uh, so now I hope that you understand what this what this thing means and why the results are uh, that you you get here. Now that basically uh, we we can reconstruct everything from just one result of one t test. We can reconstruct the other possible results like we did just now. But of course, it is um, it is more convenient when we have this. We have this function alternative. We have this option. Okay, are there questions so far about this R example? Okay, now uh, let me uh, return um, for some time to the whiteboard. Uh, the test that we uh, uh, were discussing today and on the previous lesson is called one sample t test. Uh, it is one sample because indeed we have only one sample. We have sample and some numeric value. Uh, this new node. Uh, but in fact, to make some story that supports uh, this uh, this t test, I had to. Imagine that I have this value that calculated exactly like somebody conducted full research from Moscow and measured every single person in Moscow. But on practice, we usually don't have this value. Indeed, uh, we have two samples, and we want to measure uh, their sample means and we want to compare this sample means. Uh, for example, I already uh, I al already said something about drug testing. In drug testing, you don't have this uh, manage uh, usually, but you have two groups of people, and uh, one group received uh, yeah, experimental drug, and another group received placebo, just empty something empty that looks like the drug, and uh, you then you compare. For example, how quickly recovered both people in both groups. And then you have to compare. Is it true that people in the treatment group who received uh, the medicine, the drug, uh, are they recovered more quick than people uh, who didn't receive this? And can we say that indeed this is an effect of our drug? And not an effect just by just a randomness. So to do that, we have to apply two sample t tests. Excuse me, but can you switch to the other computer? Your sound to another. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, because it shows, it shows, 
the video from that computer. Yeah, thank you. So I and I have. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. So. Uh, this is two sample tickets. And classical example is drug testing. Now uh, we have two groups. We have X1 and X2 and so on. XM. Uh, this is, for example, days to recover. In treatment group, uh, who received experimental drug, and we have another sample. Uh, this uh, it is not needed for these two samples to be of equal size. It's possible that these two samples uh, have different sizes. And again, this is days to recover uh, for placebo group. And uh, we are interested in, is it true that our experimental drug works? Uh, so basically, to formalize, I have to assume that now we have two different populations. Uh, previously, population was uh, indeed population of some city. Now, population is some uh, something rather virtual, rather imaginary. So I just believe that I have a population of possible uh, values of this of this thing. So I believe in, in something like this, that uh, I have a lot of people, just I, I took a random person on earth and uh, I make this birth, uh, I make this person to be ill with the illness that I want to, uh, to cure by this experimental drug. And then I put this person into this experimental group, and I'm trying to find uh, how long it takes to recover. And my population is all possible values of this variable for all possible people on Earth, something like this. This is rather imaginary. So if I want to speak mathematically, I just say that I have some random random variable. Uh, and uh, these values are sample from this random variable. But if anyway, anyway, this thing is called population. So I believe that I have population uh, for treatment group. So this is imaginary results, like all possible results with their probabilities. And I have goals here. And I do my sampling with replacement and I have, and, uh, I have some sample here. And I have another population 
uh, this is population for possible. And from this population, I sample my second sample. And now what I'm interested in is the following. Uh, I look at this population and uh, here is some population mean. Uh, let this population mean uh, called new one in a, or, or uh, this is better denoted by new treatment. And here I also have population mean. And uh, this is called new control, new C. And my new hypothesis. Uh, new hypothesis is usually that there is no difference between something and something. So in this case, new hypothesis is that uh, new treatment is equal to new control. So it means that it doesn't matter what to give people placebo or our experimental drug on average they will recover uh, with the same rate this is no hypothesis so basically it means that drug doesn't work and we have an alternative uh, what is an alternative in this case That they are not equal. Um, yeah, we can we can put an alternative that they are not equal, but uh, it makes sense to use this symmetric alternative if we are interested in three possible outcomes: that uh, drug is better than placebo, drug is indistinguishable from placebo, and drug is worse than placebo. But from Maybe. practical point of view. Uh, we are usually not very interested in distinguishing between the second two alternatives. Uh, I mean that we are not interested if if drug is worse than placebo, then it doesn't make sense to produce this drug. And if it is uh, the same as placebo, it also doesn't make sense to produce this drug. So interesting alternative for us is that treatment group is better uh, days to recover, days to recover should be less than control. So, drug works. And uh, makes people to recover cost. Of course, in different settings, uh, you may be interested in both. For example, if you are a medieval researcher who need uh, not only drugs, but also poisons to poison uh, his enemies, uh, then uh, you're probably interested in a symmetric alternative. Um, but in the, in the medievals, they didn't have any statistics at that time because it was invented not so recently it was invented about 100 years ago uh, so now we will we will test this hypothesis so uh, i want to uh, i want to uh, emphasize once more what we what we are doing here of course if we have two samples if this data are obtained from the from the real people, most probably uh, these sample uh, this sample sample means sample mean here and sample mean here will be different. And even if we assume that there is no any effect of this drug, uh, about in half of experiments. Uh, just just by chance, we will get the data uh, in which uh, sample mean in this group is less than sample mean in this group. Just just because these data are somewhat random, 
Just people, people are rather random things in a sense. Uh, so what we are interested in is, is it true that difference between the corresponding sample means uh, cannot be explained by this sample error, cannot be explained just by randomness in our data. This is what we are testing in each and every statistical test. We are trying to understand, is it true that some difference that we see in the data, is it true that this difference indeed suggests that some underlying effect exists? Or it is just a uh, result of some randomness in our data generation process? Uh, so uh, let me uh, Let me explain how this two sample t test is applied. Uh, how do you think? What what would you do if you have this data? So if you have two, uh, if you have these two samples, uh, what is your next step? You want to test this hypothesis. What is your next step? For example, I have I have sample X. And I have sample Y. Okay, let me put another number just to make sure that they are different. Okay, in, in sample X, I have numbers 3, 2, 5, 1, 7. In sample Y, I have numbers 4, 5, 3, 5, 7, 8. What is our first step? If you, we want to test this hypothesis that population mean that corresponds to the treatment group is less than population mean that corresponds to the control group. Uh, calculate both sample means. Yes. Okay. S bar is. Okay. I... Again, I, uh, I I need I need your help. Can you can you find sample average here and here? X bar and Y bar. Uh, here three one six. Three point six. Six six. Uh, six. Sorry. And here. Okay, everybody agree. Uh, is this result convincing to show to, to say that indeed we have an effect? Uh, indeed, we we obtained enough information to claim that uh, population mean here is less than population mean here. That mean of the population from which these values were obtained is less than mean of the population from which these values were obtained. Uh, indeed, x bar is less than y bar. But is it enough? Uh, well, yeah, yeah. In fact, we have to do something that something similar that we did previously. The difference is that previously we had we had some sample and some concrete value, but now we have two values, both of which came from some samples. So we cannot believe, for example, in this control group value. Uh, I mean that it is also it is also 
uh, somewhat random. There is some some randomness in this value because if we if we repeat the same experiment, we will have different control group and we will have different values here and different values here. So uh, what people do in this in this case, uh, they do the following. Uh, they find again t statistics, and t statistics is calculated in the following way. This is uh, x bar minus y bar, and then again I have to divide it by uh, so-called pooled standard deviation. And multiply it by uh, some pooled square root of pooled sample size. Something like this. Actually, I'm not, I, I don't want to discuss the exact formulas now, but I just want to say that uh, we have to take into account standard deviation here and standard deviation here. And we also have to take into account number of elements in this sample and number of elements in this sample. And uh, then we have formula that is very similar to the one that we discussed uh, previously. And all the effects that we uh, discussed previously they also take place here. The larger sample we have, the easier for us to reject all the points. Or for example, the larger difference we have between these two samples, or between these two sample means, the easier for us to reject those points and so on. Uh, and the good part is that everything will be defined automatically by R, in fact. Uh, but uh, I just want to make clear what we are actually doing, what we are testing. And after the test, if we reject null hypothesis, uh, we say that we see significant difference between these two sample means. Uh, it means that this is not uh, that this difference in the sense cannot be uh, explained just by pure chance, just by randomness. This difference that suggests that uh, there is a different between the corresponding populations, between the population of possible outcomes of our treatment compared to outcomes of treatment with placebo. So this is this is just theoretical explanation of what what we are we are doing. Are there any question about this part? Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the, in the, the rest of our hypothesis testing works just like previously. Uh, again, now this uh, thing is distributed according to uh, some t distribution well known, and we see that the larger this difference, um, then this value becomes larger and we can draw again, we can draw this, this picture and we can find corresponding p-values and so on. So the rest works like as before. Okay, so uh, let us now try to do it in R. Okay. 
Uh, now let us work with two sample t-tests. And uh, the corresponding function is the same t-test. Actually, uh, it can do both one sample and two sample tests. And um, basically, let us begin with uh, the example that Let me see what are the numbers. Three, two, five, one, seven. Three, two, five, one, seven. And why? Four, five, three, five, seven, eight. Four, five, three. Five, seven, eight. And we can do test. But now we put two samples here and we have to put an alternative. Let us use the alternative. So uh now x uh, x was uh the treatment group right mm -hmm. and y was control group so and we have an alternative that treatment group is less than control group so we have alternative less and let us check Is it true that our drug worked? Okay, now we have this p value. Uh, would you reject null hypothesis? No, because p value is too large. And basically, uh, it is not really, really, really large. Uh, so we have that possibly there is difference between the corresponding populations. Possibly our drug works, but we simply don't have enough data to show it because our groups are too small and the difference is not large enough to make us sure that there is the corresponding difference in the populations. We clearly see that there is difference in sample means, but can can we generalize this conclusion to the population? We don't know. So let us try something else. Again, just as an exercise, uh, let us find What happens with a uh, two-sided alternative? How do you think? If we have p-value 0.11 for alternative less, what is the p-value for alternative two-sided? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is twice as large as the previous one. And this is what, what we actually expected to see here. Okay. Mm. Now uh, let us do something with uh, some more or less real data. Just a second. Uh, 
Uh, by the way, how do you think, what happens if I just repeat? If I just repeat my uh, samples, for example, three times. So I just replicate each, each record in each sample three times. What happens in this case with the result of the t-test? How do you think? Yeah. In fact, you see that p-value now is much less than previously. And this is because we have more data. Of course, in practical research, you cannot produce data like this one. <laughs> uh, if you want more data, you have to collect more data. But this is just shows that if you indeed have more data and this new data just looks exactly like the data that you already have, then uh, this difference between between your sample means becomes more visible from statistical point of view. Okay. So now let us use some data set. Uh, I set a link to Telegram uh, and I will just type it here. So this is the data. And this is some phonetic data uh, here. Uh, different people were asked to read a word, and we have the word that was used somewhere here. And uh, for each speaker, some information was recorded uh, about uh, how how they how they pronounce uh, this word. And. I'm sorry, unfortunately, I don't remember where we or, or where these data were talking. I have to I have to ask uh, Garik Maros, who probably is uh, the person who isn't it Dagestan? Probably. I just don't I just don't know. It was it was on our course, uh, I believe, three years ago or something like that, but I just don't remember. Basically, if it to... was Garik's R course, it, I think it was Dagestan because I remember this probably. data set. Mm, yeah, probably. Yeah. And uh, now let us uh, let us do something with this data set. Uh, I mean that I want to use some uh, some variable, for example, word duration. or time, and we can compare two groups. Uh, for example, we can get um, for example, I can create two samples. Uh, I'm interested in the, the following question. Uh, is it true that 
uh, time from round. I don't know what is it. Is, is it characteristic of sound? Uh, round sounds are is greater or less than time for unrounded sounds. So oh, this is the question that I'm interested in for some reason. I'm not a specialist in phonetics uh, and uh, we worked with Gary for several years and every year I asked him what is four months and he explained to me what is four months and I said okay and then next year it was uh, the same so probably probably I'm just hopeless in phonetics it is too difficult for me so around times yeah I, and I just I just get uh, a part of this data set uh, that corresponds to um, uh, get values of time variable uh, roundness equals to round. Do you know how to do it? What should I write here uh, to get this? This slice. Do you know how to select uh, some specific roles in a data set that satisfies some condition? Uh, we can use a dollar sign. Uh, we can use dollar sign to get a specific column, uh, but uh, the problem is uh, that we are not interested in all values from this column, but we want to split it. Hmm? We, we, we have, um, we um, could cho cho choose um, um, like uh, the uh, subset when a d uh, dead dollar sign time is um, like mm -hmm. uh, more than some uh, value yes. or less yes. or equal to some value. Yes, but we are, but now we are interested in this condition. So we want to compare, uh, we want to compare time for round sounds and for unrounded sounds. So we want to check this condition. We can okay. use filter function. From the filter, yeah, yes, we can. Uh, yes, we can. But basically, uh, this simple thing can be done uh, just with basic R. Actually, I just don't want to install R uh, uh, to, to, to install Tediverse on this computer because it can take time. So I will use plain old R. And I want that uh, roundness equals to round. Let us look how it works. Yeah. So this thing, uh, this thing gives me all the rows that corresponds to this condition. And uh, I want a column time, and I can put it just here. I believe. Yeah. So this is round times. And uh, in the same way, I will create a variable. Uh, how to call it? Non-random. Non-round times. Unround times. This is called unround times. So now I have two samples. 
uh, round times. Uh, let us find the corresponding mean. Uh, round times. Um, and some other values that can be interesting. So we have 300 elements in uh, round times and Five hundred six elements with unrounded times, and we have some difference uh, between the corresponding means. So for round times, mean uh, is clearly less than for unrounded times. But uh, can we claim that indeed we have some effect? Can we claim that it is true that for round times, uh, this sound has less time than for unrounded. So uh, how do you think? In fact, it is rather difficult just by looking at this number to say something because in fact, you have to divide the standard deviation by square root of this length and then you can just do something. Okay, then exercise. Now. Use the test. To Can we say that? There is statistically significant. Oh, in fact, you have all the information to, to do this exercise. So I ask you to, to do it by yourself. I think we need just several minutes to do it. And you can write me your code. Uh, and uh, that is even more important to write me your results. I mean, your interpretation. So, would you reject no hypothesis? 
would you say that there is some statistically significant difference? To say that there is some statistically significant difference is the same as to say that we rejected null hypothesis that there is no difference between the corresponding population needs. So you can use the same function t.test and you will get p-value and you have to interpret. You have to specify a correct alternative and so on. If you have any questions, any problems with the code, just let me know.
Ah, this is what we will do. Yeah, I see. And we try, we try, time. Time is like the start of the whole world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, this is fine. Yes. Uh -huh. And it's where the power starts with the power. It's the power of the Okay, go ahead. I can check this too, but I think it's not. Uh, oh, okay. okay. A anyway, we can we can go this thing with different powers. So, if I if uh, I need to show some parts of my code, just let me know. If you have any questions about the code, just let me know. But I want I want the answer. And I have several answers right now, but I want more. If something doesn't work, let me know. Okay, uh, let us uh, continue and let us uh, check what's going on here. So uh, I want, first of all, um, I don't have any pre-specified uh, alternative here. I'm just interested in, uh, is it true that there is some difference? So I have to use symmetric alternative. And uh, actually this symmetric alternative is the default in test, so I just can run times and run the times. I just run this command and I get, yeah, yeah. Actually, in the output of this t test, we have uh, we have an alternative. Uh, now, this is the true difference in means is not equal to zero. Uh, true difference means that this is the difference between the corresponding population means, not actually the sample means that we observe, but population means that we do not observe. And uh, here uh, we have p-value all dot 33. And uh, this p-value is larger than 5%, so we do not reject no hypothesis. Uh, note that even if you do not reject null hypothesis, it doesn't actually means that you proved that null hypothesis holds because uh, our statistical tests are constructed in such a way uh, that they basically cannot prove that null hypothesis works. They can only reject it or if uh, there is not enough evidence in favor of rejecting. They just say, I don't know. Basically, this result, uh, result do not reject H, uh, H null, means uh, the answer, like, I don't know. We don't have enough data because 
in fact, it is possible that uh, we have the difference between two populations, but these two different is very small and we just don't see it with our data. Probably we just need more data to see this difference. But also it is possible that uh, there is no difference at all. So the case do not reject null hypothesis is, is just some very inconclusive result. But if we reject null hypothesis, then, then it is rather conclusive. We claim that null hypothesis does not hold and an alternative holds. Well, yes? And then we will find different evidence. Like it may be different because of what we want to know, but maybe this uh, if we have like two hundred examples, mm -hmm. uh, it's more probable that we will find something. Yeah. Uh, what can we do in this situation? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Uh, this is uh, this is a good question. Uh, what happens if we have a lot of data, and uh, we are, for, for example, what what happens if we have like a lot of variables or a lot of groups, and we are trying to find difference between any of these groups, and uh, we will discuss it in more details later. But there are statistical tools that allows you to deal with uh, with this uh, kind of problem. Uh, so it is possible to do it correctly, to do correctly uh, several, uh, for example, compare several groups. I mean, um, it happened to me uh, in my practice when I had to, I wanted to understand if there is difference between two constructions. So, yes. Uh, and in one case, uh, I want to find difference and I find it. And in the other case, I don't find it and it's okay. Mm -hmm. But then I use the other focus, and it's uh, 1,000 billion. And in this case, I find difference in both cases, but in the second one, uh, I cannot explain it. And it looks like the difference is just because, well, any two words are different. So if you have lots of data, you will find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you have to um, I see, I see. So basically you have hmm. uh, the correct way uh, to to deal with this stuff is when you just you you formulate your hypothesis uh, before, you, before you look at the data. And if you have several tests that you perform, for example, with different data and so on, um, the, the correct way is to use uh, something like Bonferroni correction uh, to, uh, to adjust for possible, uh, the, for, for, for possible multiple comparison problem. But, Probably it is better to discuss your concrete problem uh, uh, individually because I'm not sure that I understand the full details. Okay, uh, I uh, actually uh, we we spend some times uh, we, we spend some time creating these these variables, round times and unrounded times. But uh, instead, uh, we can do it in a more simple way. Uh, in fact, this t-test function uh, allows you to um, uh, allows you to find uh, to do t-test in the following way. So 
So I'm interested in variable time and I'm interested in roundness. And my data is dark. And you see exactly the same result as previous. So uh, here we have this formula, and uh, this is actually uh, the usual way in R uh, to write formulas that uh, mean uh, some dependence in variables. So basically in this t-test we ask, is it true that time, variable time, depend on roundness? So we, we have this relation between two variables. And uh, this is uh, actually under the code R uh, do the same thing as we did previously. It creates uh, two samples. Uh, it uses this variable roundness to distinguish between these two samples. So uh, we can make sure that this roundness we have only two levels, so let us test it. No, it doesn't work like this. Okay, uh, we see that this roundness has uh, only two possible values, round and unround. Uh, so this variable roundness splits our data set uh, into two parts. Uh, yes, thank you, Dmitry. Uh, and uh, so this this is this is how uh, this com comparison can be done in a short way. So we can try uh, some other variable, for example, uh, vowel duration. And we can compare vowel duration for different rounds. Okay. This is that vowel. So how would you interpret this uh, result? You have p-value 1.587e minus 0.5. But by default, our alternative is two-sided. Yes, by default, it is two-sided. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, uh, every time you run this function and you look at the result, it reminds you what is your alternative. So, um, so uh, how to interpret this p-value? We can reject new hypothesis in favor of our alternative. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in fact, this p-value is small. So this e minus O5 means 10 to the power minus minus five. So it is 0. 0.00015 or something like this. So five zeros uh, in your number. And uh, so it is, uh, it is indeed less than 5%. I hope everybody are familiar with this scientific notation, but if not, then uh, this is just e, e minus O5 is just 10 to the power minus, minus five. And mm, by the way, uh, what, other, what other outcome can, uh, what other conclusion can we do by looking at this result? So uh, indeed we have, we have a significant difference. 
Uh, so what is larger? Where vowel duration is larger? In which group? Hmm? Um, as far as I see, this is for round, um, mean in group round is uh, 91 and mean in group on round that is 83. So again, uh, just by inspecting uh, this output of this t-test, you see this, uh, this means. Uh, so this is how this uh, hypothesis testing is done. Uh, just to conclude, let me show you a way to visualize uh, so how to draw a picture that is um, sometimes it is useful for these kind of comparisons. Uh, there is a picture that is called box plot. And let us draw it. I just put the same formula. So this is not exactly uh, related to, to t-test uh, because in these box plots, uh, they uh, draw a little bit different values. Um, let me make this picture larger, yeah. Uh, so in this box plot, this, this line is median of your data in both samples. And uh, this box uh, is uh, actually this part of the box is first quartile and this is the third quartile. Do you know what quartile is? So you just split your sample in four more or less equal parts and borders uh, of this part are quartiles. So uh, the half of your sample lies here. And uh, these things are called whiskers and mm, they are constructed in the following way. I just use this difference between uh, this value and this value. This is called interquartile range. And I multiply it by 1.5, one and a half. And then this thing is uh, this thing, uh, this whisker is the last element that lie in this uh, one and a half quartile interval from, from here. Actually, I don't know why uh, these values were chosen, why uh, one and a half. This is just a convention. And the same thing here. So we put this one and a half quartile interval and we find the largest value that lie in this interval. And all other values here and here and here are just plotted with a single dots and they are called outliers. Uh, basically, uh, uh, that's a not very well-defined term, uh, well-defined notion in statistics, what to call an outlier. But uh, in this, uh, in the construction of this box and whiskers plot, uh, they call outliers the values that like out of this one and a half uh, quartile range. So basically this is a way to very roughly uh, draw your distribution, visualize your distribution. Uh, the good way to visualize distribution is histogram, but here is just a very rough approximation to histogram. But anyway, it allows you to see that, for example, values here probably are slightly larger than values here. At least median here is slightly larger than median here. And it also allows you to see that your distribution is not symmetric because, for example, you have a lot of outliers here and small amount of outliers here. So some information about the distribution 
uh, you can find uh, in this picture. And uh, sometimes people draw these pictures just to show two distributions side by side to, to compare them. But uh, this picture doesn't uh, allow your, at least this, this exact picture, doesn't allow you to make any statistical conclusions. I mean, uh, you cannot say, for example, that to get statistical significant difference, you have that this thing um, be under this thing, which is not true. This is just this, this is just um, description, visual, visual, visual description of your distribution of your variable. But sometimes it is useful to, to, to draw these pictures. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, I think we can finish here because I uh, I told every everything that that I planned. Okay. And that's all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So Thank you.